Um, I'm Ryan. I'm from Bob Red Mill. I'm the director of the IT department over there. Uh, I've got a small group of people. Um, we manage everything that's plugged into the wall, literally. <laughs> so, um, but uh, I think of all the things that we've got, one of my favorite tools is the Wisest product. Um, we've really struggled over the years with growth. Uh, our products are particularly popular right now. Um, and it's just, it's, it's an easy way to get to those challenging IT, or get through those challenging IT problems when they're thrown on your desk in the middle of the afternoon and you know it was coming, but now somebody's got the ability of it and they want a solution and they want it now. So um, anyhow, in my uh, little uh, presentation here, I'll tell you a quick little bit about <coughs> Any of you were at uh, Impact Engage last year. Uh, Trey actually did a nice presentation with the video. And uh, I just figured we'd talk more about why system bought Red Mill, but I'll do a quick introduction. So uh, we were established in about 73. We've got a little over 250 employees. Uh, we're headquartered in Milwaukee, Oregon. And that is spelled right. <laughs> For the people from the other Milwaukee. Uh, we have about 1,200 SKUs. Um, most of our products come in multiple sizes, so you know we have one product would be in five different sizes. We'll have a bag, a case, a 25 pound bag, a 50 pound bag, sometimes a pallet. Um, we do in-house manufacturing, so most of our stuff comes in, as I described, in truckloads. Um, we break that truckload up, we mix it, we mill it, we clean it, we package it, uh, we put it in in cases and we palletize it and send it out the door many, many, many times a day. <laughs> uh, we've been using, we use progression. Uh, when I first got hired, I helped us get into the ES platform. Um, we have been around the floor for a long time and I think at least one person from the company has been to engage pretty much every year it's, it's been going on. So we have a long history with Exact as well. Uh, we ESOP in 2010 meaning the employee stock ownership program, so the company is now employee owned. Um, it was a huge landmark. Uh, our CEO really wanted to pass the company on. He's in his 80s now. He's still actively uh, directing the company, but he really wanted the employees to take over the, the company once he, uh, once he steps down. Uh, we do over $100 million of annual sales, and uh, we're growing. Uh, we have amazing products, and most importantly, we have amazing people. Um, people are very passionate about the company. Uh, it's a lot of us share the passion, and it just makes it really fun to, to grow up with. Um, this is a picture of the world headquarters. Uh, Bob drives his cars in pretty much every day. He's got a few of them. Um, that's me. <laughs> so I'm not making this all up. <laughs> Pictures to prove it. But uh, anyhow, there's about 200 employees there. Now we're up to about 250, and that was shot in 2010 during the ESOP migration. Uh, why do we use Wysys? So, um, McCullough's user interface. And we all know it. It's just painful. It's difficult to use. Uh, a lot of people are used to it, but as an IT person, when we're trying to change and adapt, flexibility is extremely difficult to get something knocked out quickly. And a lot of times there's a lot of debugging. Um, sometimes the upgrades to uh, Nicola were breaking our flex. Uh, we just, you know, a lot of reasons why flex just wasn't working for us. Although we did use it for a long time to get over some problems. 24-hour um, manufacturing. This is another big problem. As, as we grow, we would you know, start doing more shifts. Well, we used to do things at night when we would do the back flush model. It's cool. Everybody goes home for the day. The data entry guy could stay a few extra hours and push that stuff through. Well, 24 hours a day, you don't have that option. So we need real-time uh, entry and real-time analysis. Um, it allowed us to salvage our investment with full ADS. Uh, as you move to more of a real-time plan, you can start looking at other options. But man, are they expensive compared to keeping what you've got in terms of training, end user, uh, you know, just acceptance, uh, and, and then dollars and cents. Uh, Real-time transaction I mentioned, validation for safety. 
Uh, we make a lot of gluten-free products. We have to make sure that the glutenous products don't get into the gluten-free products. We use a lot of validation to do that. It used to be extraordinarily manual uh, and slow, and now we can use the guns or the scanners uh, to, to do validation. Uh, fast development using objects. So Michael has just done a presentation on the Tic Tac 4 objects, but not having to actually manually write storage pr procedures to do things that are difficult to understand sometimes in the first place when the experts are doing it and then just use their objects to quickly roll things out. Um, and uh, it slowed our internal efforts to build similar processes to .NET. So as a director, I'm absolutely elated when one of my people come to me with a solution that they just built in .NET. Um, and it used to be, I'm sure, a lot of you guys have access or something, you know, they have this side cable and they have this, but the problem is that managing all that is really difficult. Um, so now, rather than having to build out all these individual little things that do things like, um, for example, in order entry, so just when we update the date in the header, we wanted to fire some of the lines. Well, we had to write something in .NET to do that outside of or outside of Google. And now we can do these kind of things on the fly using Agile. So um, it keeps everything all kind of tied together, and we're all learning and, and doing the same thing. I mean, my my people are really good, and they do a good job marking up their code. But it's still, when you dive in and it's something you built four and a half years ago, it, it can be difficult, and it slows those without being. I guess rude about it, saying they don't do that. Because we always want progress, but we want to be have management progress. Okay, so have it your way. That's kind of the topic of this uh, presentation. Um, we're unique. We need systems that work the way we do. Uh, mistakes in our business are costly. We need real-time validation processes. Um, if I put sugar in something that needed salt, that whole mix is gone. It's really hard to pick out. <laughs> And we found many ROI opportunities, pardon for the title there, using the Y system. Okay. So from the top, receiving. Um, receiving was where most people that use Y system will start. It, you have to start populating tables someplace, and this is the place that we start. Um, we looked at our receiving process for quite a while, and we came up with this little process flow. Um, again, we receive things in truckloads. So a truckload is usually going to be 44,000 pounds, the legal limit for them to carry. Um, it's going to have 22 totes of something, and they're going to be in about 2,000 pound increments. Um, so the first thing they're going to do is pull those pallets off, they're going to scale and pack. So they pull them off, we tear the weight onto the scale. The scale, and, and we do have IP enabled scales, we're still working on the integration between that and WISIS, but Right now, they're just punching in the, the weight. Um, we capture that weight, and then we issue a tag to it, which actually gives it an individual lot number for that individual toe. And then it gets staked for foot I mean, I'm trying to go fast through this, because I know there's going to be questions at the end. But uh, if anybody wants to stop me and have me elaborate on something else. All right. So um, again, I, I kind of covered this stuff in the process. Uh, and then on that custom label, we create what's called a quick scan ID, and I'll go over that. It kind of shows one of the powers of Wysis, where you can really make this thing um, efficient and accurate. And we immediately sample and put a lab sample label in receiving inspection. So um, again, we have um, all kinds of triggers, but a, a lab person comes down, and they scan that bag right as it comes off the truck before it's ever put away and brought in if it's contaminated. And they take that lab sample just right, right then and there. And they take it up to the lab and they start testing. We test 100% of our gluten-free products. And we spot test a lot of our conventional stuff. So, and that's at receiving. And then we spot check our mixes. Um, we, we spot check other places as well. But we do a lot of testing in our stuff. It's critical for our business to make sure that these things are what they say on the Okay, so our first showstopper. We're, we're rolling, we've got guys trained, I'm excited. We're getting the hardware installed. And uh, we've never used bins in our building before. And if you don't have YSYS right now, you may not have bins. We did, we just did everything manually. Um, so we need bins. We have over 300,000 square feet of 
storage in our warehouse. Um, so <coughs> my advice to us was, well, you just have to make sure nothing's on order. You got to make sure that um, nothing has a profit order for it. Uh, nothing's expected to be received, and nothing is in stock. And then you can go and set your flag, and everything's great. Okay. <laughs> So I'm thinking to myself, so that sounds a little time consuming. Okay, so I'm not even going to go down that road, but there's just absolutely no way to do this that way. So here it is in a grid. We solved it. Um, this, and I, I got to thank Justin and, and Michael for their help in this, because it took a little bit of wrapping our heads around it to make it work. But what we did is we created a grid, and in this grid we have everything, and this is out of my test company, because. I pulled it up in the real company. Of course, everything's been bid, and this was wonderful. Thank God I had a little data. Um, so we can look at everything that's got a serial lot and that doesn't have a serial lot. And we just basically check all the boxes and hit the convert button, and it pushes it into another location. And then it, and it's all out of inventory. We set the flag in the other location, and when we transfer it back in, it's a bid item, and it has to come in with a bid flag. So um, it was a... It's amazing it worked, and it saved us ungodly amounts of time. So since then, we've converted all of our items to bin items using this grid, and we've done them in chunks. I actually have uh, added the material cost type, and so like here, I can just say, well, today I just want to do all my packaging. Let's transfer all the packaging into bins, and then let's go out, and then let's put those in their actual locations. So, all right, 22 totes, we need help. Um, 44,000 pound truck, 22 tubs, 22 receivers, makes a big data mess. Uh, and, and especially for the guys that are out there receiving, um, they're getting all this stuff and they want to know where they're at. Well, they can on their gun just get a button and it'll create a little manifest for them. So if they miscount it and they over receive, now for one, the, the gun is counting down as they're receiving the 44,000. But um, this is just nice for them. And at the end, they print this manifest and they attach it to their paperwork. And that's what the people look at who are just kind of quickly looking at receiving the office. Right. 44,000 pounds come in from your supplier. Is that all one lot? No. And I'll, I'll get to that. Okay. Because that's, that's, that's another powerful thing that we do on the dock that we didn't use to do. Um, so, also, I'm working on a batch transfer uh, for Manifest, and I, I talked about that in the last group, so I won't go over it. But basically, I want to take the pallet object and create a truckload instead of a pallet, and be able to transfer the grouping of pallet or of uh, totes all into its put away location, so the guys have to scan, 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 scan 22 times. Um, and then I built a bunch of agility streams for purchasing. They slice this data. <coughs> Okay, so here's some quick label, label samples. Um, this here is our receiving manifest. So um, it's got the uh, receiver number, lot, um, who received it, and uh, the weight. And again, all of our stuff weighs different. And the reason this is important is a lot of people overship weight just to make sure that they satisfy the contract. So in some cases, we'll get 2,200 pounds. It, it's off by 10% and you throw it in red mix, it makes Next. So we want to know the exact way, and now we do. Um, and then, of course, it's got a running photo down the side. Okay. So, and then this one here, um, this is a little detached from the previous slide, but, oh wait, I'm sorry. Yeah, this right here is our receiving label, and this label actually looks the same in, in a multitude of places. First off, in receiving, you can see it's got the quick scan up there. Again, it's out of my test company, so it's only numbered up to 30. But, um, the, the quick scan also, this label prints out when we do um, production. So the pop label looks exactly the same, except for instead of being a receiver number encoded in quick scan, it's actually the pallet number, okay? Or if it's something that I don't want palletized for a specific reason, I actually put the lot number there, which keeps it specific. And the thing is, is that when we train people, we don't want to tell them, well, if it's a received item, make sure that you scan the receiver. But if it's not received and it's manufactured, I mean, it's just way too complicated. All we tell them is when you're going to issue something or put something on the pallet, hit the quick scan. That's it. 
it's one shot and you're done. You know, system generated. What's that? Your quick scan is that system yes, generated. Yes, because your receiver is your Mercola receiver number that's created in the IM ref kits, right? So right there at the receipt, it's going to take the next one. Um, and then your pallet's going to also be auto-generated when you're in, in production. And then your serial lot, depending on how you have your serial lot set up, we're also, you know, serial lot, or however you do that. But we, we do it in a way that it's by batch, and each batch increments by one. So they're all you need. Okay. Blanket order monitoring. I just want to cover this one real quick. So this is one of those ones that gets dropped on my desk. We have hundreds of blanket orders for millions of dollars of product. And the receiving guys want to know, well, where am I at on my blankets, right? When should I go and call this vendor and say, hey, you're doing a good job, you're doing a bad job, I need to reorder? They can't keep tabs on it through Mercola. It's just really difficult to look at the blanket. So in this grid, I'm basically showing all of our blankets up here. I've redacted the vendors. Anyhow, this shows us our um, our blanket and shows us on each one of those blanket POs where they have, so when it's green, it means it's been satisfied. And then they can basically take a quick look at it and see for the whole year, because we contract things for the year, they can see the entire thing just in, in one shot here. And then I made a um, request, and, and this is part of the nice thing about Wysis is um, I'll come up with this weird reason why I really need something. And my weird reason on this one was um, what, when I was using the Outlook tool for the first time, which is awesome, uh, it was just tied back to order entry. And I, I called them and I said, guys, could you please tie it back to the vendor tables? Because off the vendor number, when I get an email from a vendor, I can immediately pull this up in Outlook without even leaving the screen and see the status of all the blanket orders and other things too. But they built it, thank you, because we used the heck out of it. OK, receiving detail, just a crystal report. I'm sure everybody here has seen enough of that. OK, so that was easy. The receiving stuff, pretty straightforward. Um, it was fun. The pop side was much more difficult. So our production goals. So these are kind of some of the things that I wrote up in my initial report. We're going to provide real-time status reporting for all production lines, mixers, and mills. We're going to collect production times for scheduling and performance. Uh, use strong verification to avoid improper material issues. <coughs> create new serial lot tracking methods, create pallet layers to group finished goods, and accurately report production and close pop orders without mistake. And Trey back there really appreciates that. Yes. <laughs> okay. Can you make that smaller? Yeah. I'm sorry this didn't translate well. Um, there's a whole lot of stuff that went into pop reporting, a whole lot of projects. Um, and of course, this looks great when I'm looking at it on my screen. But uh, I'm not going to go through this. It's just a bunch of stuff. OK, it all starts on the floor. So all of our stuff, and this is the whole, I guess, point of this talk, is we're very unique. And we have so many little idiosyncrasies about the company, we're not going to change. OK? I'm sorry, can you back up some production goals just for a second? Oh, yeah. So all of our tools, um, issue, put away, uh, everything has been built from scratch because of that exact um, Everything that we do starts on the floor. I, we, we set up the pop order, but as far as the data collection for Wysis and Pop, um, first thing we do is we start the line with the guy. Uh, and then, you know, we start issuing, or pardon me, we start issuing with the guy. Once the, once the production order is, you know, is rolling on the line, we start the line. If there's a pause on the line, we pause it with the gun. We record production with the gun. We close that um, pop order. Not, not meaning we, we, we stop the time on the gun. 
we close the poplar at the desk. The employees that are on the floor don't understand the ratios well enough to close them on the desk, although we could have done that. Okay. Um, but it all starts on the floor. What I mean is we're just getting this data from the employees in real time on the floor. Okay, so quick scan. Now I'm going to dive into this a little bit because this is something that really is incredible for us. Um, remember, we're growing like mad, and we're also on pen and paper, and we're backflushing. So we're writing down a lot of lots, or we're having to pick lots, and we're pulling through their lock screen, which it, everything is just taking an unbelievable amount of time. We're hiring people just to do data entry, and it's very, very difficult. And this was years ago when, you know, these four devices. If I couldn't imagine doing it today, I would, we'd have departments for it. So, when I design these, every step of the system is analyzed. Meaning, we look at every step, everything that somebody's entering into the system and say, do we really need to do that, and can we find it from a lookup, or through SQL, or through some kind of smart analysis of the data, and uh, not make them input it on the gun. And my goal for my team is, for every process we do, I want one step. And in some cases, it's impossible. But if it's possible at all, that's how we're going to do it. Okay. Um, then quick scan was designed for material issues. However, it's been used in many other screens. So the quick scan ID is now used in the lab. We can you know, get a pop product, or we can get a receive product, or we can get it right off of the plot. Oh, OK. Um, and, and we took this idea and we pushed it out. And the nice thing is that once you've done it once in Form Studio, you can take the same idea, basically the same SQL, and apply it to other projects very quickly. So again, quick scan is a name for various data IDs to the end user. So we never explain to our production workers or to our warehouse workers how this works. We just give them the very basic detail of when you're going to issue something, issue it off the quick scan, okay? And if that fails, here's the workaround where you scan the item ID, the lot, and then punch in the form. So, and I always like to leave a little bit of the safety valve. But really, for us in IT, the quick scan number is actually the name for multiple points of data. It's the receiver number, it's the pallet number, and it's the lot number. So those values are all called quick scan to the end user. But to us, and I can look at any of those numbers and know which one it is just by the data length, and by the stream length, and by the format. But the end user doesn't need to know any of that. They just need to know it's the quick scan. So, and, and that's how we use it. Your definition of quick scan is if you get those 22 totes in, one of those totes, like that would be quick, that would be pallet number, tote number 30, which would go over your receiving number, your pallet number, and your lot. Is that correct? Okay. That one is actually out of my test company, and that one is actually a pallet ID of 30 because we're just using the object. Okay. But if it was a receiver number, you would recognize the receiver number. It'd be like the you know 11 digit receiver number that you get in the pull. Right. Um, if it's so, if I've got a received item and I'm going to issue it, let's just say it's flour, right? right. And let's say the receiver was 200,000. Right. Um, they go to the quick scan, and that quick scan number will say 200,000 underneath it. And they'll scan it, okay? And then that's going to pull up data. Um, on the other hand, if we took that flour and we somehow mixed it with something and we made oak flour out of it, so now it becomes a pallet. And, and the pallet word is, is difficult because a pallet to us also means totes. So we just created a 2,100 pound tote of oak flour, and its tote number is 30. But that's the pallet ID or the package ID in Pick Pack 4 that they're going to scan. Okay, So a completely different number, but all they know, because those two things might be sitting side by side on the floor and they're going to issue them, just scan the quick scan. You know, Don't go looking for the receiver, don't go looking for, just scan the quick scan. Now will you be able, if there's a problem with that product, go out the whole thing, you can be called. you be able for your quick scan to like AID and other Absolutely, and I'll show that here in a second. Yep, absolutely. Okay, but the point here is that we've got multiple data points under one heading, right? So that it's it's easy for the end user. Okay, 
And then once they hit that quick scan, it instantly populates the items a lot within the description and the quantity of the exam from any of those values. And then the accuracy is key, right? So one scan creates amazing accuracy. I mean, either they scan the wrong thing or the right thing. And if they scan the wrong thing, we're looking at it against the bill of materials, and it's going to turn red anyways. So we don't even have this problem anymore since the quick scan. And then the quick scan may be bypassed by simply scanning the item number. So if the quick scan for some reason doesn't work, maybe the pallet's broken open because of the pallet let down or whatever, um, they can actually just scan the item ID and do it the old fashioned way where they scan the item, they scan the lot, and then they punch in the quantity. So they do have a bypass. Okay. How does it work? Right? It's cool to show it, but so this is a little more on the technical side. Here's Form Builder Studio. So first thing we do is we're looking at the order. So the order is going to go out and it's going to, and, and this is for production, okay? So we're going to take the order, the order is going to bring in the bill of materials, all right? If they scan something on the component line, and this actually says quick scan now, but um, if they scan something here on the, the component line, um, it's going to reject it if it falls outside of the bill of materials. So if they go try to put that uh, sugar where salt was supposed to be, it just turns red and says no. So there's your first validation step. So the next thing is they scan components. And if you look, I've got component here highlighted. If you look on that item, you can see I have nine SQL events attached to it in three formulas. Okay. So the quick scan magic happens in the SQL events that fire right after you collect your data. So you hit the barcode, and here it is. So basically what we're doing is we're telling it to go look in all these tables and go get that information. If it's not a receiver, just move on, okay? So you know where it has the error code in the next step, we just leave that blank. So it just passes right by, it goes to the next. Um, and then if it's not in the pallet tables, you can see the new pallet table there, move on. And then if it's not in the serial lock table, move on. And if it's not one of those three things, which are the only three things that are, we're attacking right now, then it's a component. And then go look that up. And if that item is there, then it's been, you know, you're going to have to answer all the other questions. But any of those three, and they even have handle duplicates in here, although that seldom happens, but it's there. So, and then the rest of this stuff is just, assigning variables and other pieces that we use for other things. But that's quick scan right there. So, and how powerful is that, right? It took a while to come up with it, but I can't even imagine the number of hours that we've saved in not trying to figure out problems with them scanning the wrong things the wrong lot, punching in 21 pounds instead of 21 pounds. Okay, so any questions on that? Cool. All right, production monitor. So as part of production, we want to know in real time what's going on on all the lines in an, in an instant. So to do that, we actually built out these screens, uh, the pause, the production time, and then the managers even have right there on their barcode scanner a line status screen that shows exactly what's going on on each line, if they're paused or if they're stopped or if they just recorded the power. So um, this is all custom built into tables that we custom built for this need, um, just all apart. And then this is the basic uh, building blocks of it. And again, you know, we, what we need to do is figure out how to use the data once we capture it. And it just kind of lays it out. What happens if you posit it? Um, how do we reject or order? Do we use the time in, in from the stamp order from the stamp back? Nothing at all. No, this does not true. exist in Macola. It, now, if you use shop floor, there might be some component of that that I don't know about. We, we're, we use pop. But we track our time this way. Okay. So what's that look like to the managers? Here's an agility screen where it shows them basically the percent complete on each order, what they're making, uh, the description, the line that they're on, uh, the order quantity, the quantity reported. And then down here you see the individual pallets coming along with the individual lots. Okay. Next, 
Um, and then also, here, here's easy access to all this stuff we use all, all the time. And one of those things is uh, ratios, which I'll show you. And then the other one is this report here, which is a one status report. So someone else earlier asked, can you tie event manager somehow back to ISIS? This is an event manager thing that fires off four times a day. Um, and then the, a few other instances we fired off as well. Uh, basically what this is is a crystal report, and it's using custom table data that we've collected through the Wysis object and, and, and put into this table. And this is telling us exactly for every production line, its duration, what we've made, um, how, how far it's done, when it started, when the last time an event triggered, uh, when we anticipate it to end, and what the current case per hour, this is a hand pack line by the way, our machines aren't quite that slow. And then how many pallets have been made and what the last pallet ID was to come on. Okay? And then if something is in a pause mode, it'll even tell you why. There's no operator there. Um, no operator there. And then if it stopped, the order's complete and it shows you your total last time. Okay? So all that, and it's just firing up. Now we used to have managers write this report. It took them an hour per shift. So three, three times a day. And then at our production meeting at 1 o'clock, our most important managers would all put their heads together and build one of these and then talk about it for a So now it just arrives on their iPads, on their iPhones. They're just walking through the mill. And they get immediate um, visibility to this. And then in addition to that, I have an agility grid that exactly mimics this. So if they want to go right now, not the last time it had been the event manager fired it off. They have that ability as well. Okay, so then talking about the, the data that we're collecting and how else to use it, we actually build our line schedules from the data that we collected off of that as well. And it puts together our production rates, it puts together our run times. And that way, um, and I, we've been trying to build this in the link for a while. It's an ongoing project, um, and someday we'll, we'll get there. We're, we're having a little trouble getting our production guys to like the link interface, although we love it. Um, they're just used to doing it in a different way. But we're taking that data, and we're actually populating the link tables. And from those link tables, or what do they call it now, the exact visual plan. So it's, it's linked to us. But anyhow, from those tables, we create these crystal reports that produce some very uh, detailed reporting for the line schedule. Okay. So the new lot numbers and return on investment. This was an interesting one because in my uh, ROI study that I did to get funding for this project, I would never have thought of this in a million years. And this turned out to be one of our biggest uh, ROI factors that so far. Um, so production time is one of our most, most valuable assets. I mean, we have a limited number of machines and operators run machines and all that stuff costs money. Uh, the old method, we relied on Julian dates. So at receiving, basically, we received something on day 1307, and that was its lot number. And we combined these Julian dates in a real funky way, and everything was done on paper, but really, it was the Julian date, which is relatively unimportant to everything else that's going on. Um, why does this enable a smaller division of lots and complete traceability? That's critical. You could never do this without having something to collect this in very small slices. Okay. Um, received items can be traced back to the vendor lot and code. Someone else asked me that question, and I'll show you the grid. Finished goods can be traced back even in complex mixes. And, uh, we use these tools every day for random lamp steps, lab sample. Our new method, we save 5 to 15% total <coughs> time. So, one of the things here that is almost embarrassing, but it's how true we are to our customers. We used to clean out between lots, okay? So, if we receive something on Tuesday from a vendor, and then we got the exact same load from the exact same vendor, <coughs> the same vendor lock, right? On Wednesday, it became a different lock in our system. 
which forced us to clean our machine valve, which can take two to four hours depending on the plug. So we go in, we'd stick raw materials in our machine, and we get to a point where we switch from lot 1307 to 1308, meaning one was received on Tuesday and one was received on Wednesday. We stop the entire production process, completely clean out the line between the lots, and then jam the exact same material back in the machine and start up again. All right? And we did this across 20 production lines, sometimes 70 to 10 times a day. So now we don't do that at all anymore. Because not only did it really not matter that we received it on Tuesday and Wednesday, and I pretty much proved that. That's really where our line in the sand is, what day we received it. Um, we, we just work straight through it. And from that, we, by the estimates of our production manager, who I trust the most, because he's got his finger on it, on the poll, he's saying 5 to 15% of his production time, depending on the material. So it's huge. <clears throat> so to date, this and unexpected ROI has been the most valuable in terms of traceable dollars, meaning we can actually say this much time was spent doing that, and that much time cost us this much money. <clears throat> There's a lot of things about WISIS which you can't really tag with the dollar sign. You can say it's a hell of a lot better than it was, but really what's the value in terms of dollar and cents? And you can't tag it with the number. This I, I can, and I did. And then we use different methods to bolster our, or we use the methods to bolster our position, position with customers and third party buyers. So passive, all those kind of things. Um, we show them this kind of stuff, and they just about give it. It's fun. They, they love this kind of trace of All right. So someone asked me, quick lot trace with this position. Um, this came across my desk. Everyone does not like By the way, I will mention a fact, an interesting fact. The dispossession and the tracing tools built into Macola were a project that Bosra and Mill paid for through Exact, and it got built into the push code. So anyhow, a little history. Mm -hmm. um, and and they're, they're pretty good, but really we wanted something that in, in terms of, especially in terms of real time. So I built this grid here, and let's see, this one is showing you we're making something, and then that's all the product that went into it, and then there's the actual component block tra trace detail. So disposition from the, the Bob's Red Mill cereal lot that went in, you know, that's your Macola lot number, right? And then that matches up down here all the way back to the manufacturing lot in, and even the tote bag it came in. So we've literally had times where we say, hey, we found a piece of plastic in your tote 15, and the vendors are like shocked that we can trace it that tight. Um, we go down, and like I said before, we go to a very uh, finite level, and you could not do that without the real-time tools. Okay, lot matching for receivers. So here's an interesting screen in which we can look at all of our receivers, you know, for a specific order or item or however you filter your grid, and I can go back and say, I can say our tote 22 was their tote 82, okay? So it's a real easy way to match that up. And more and more, our vendors are putting their lot numbers in barcodes on our income good. Now you can't tell farmers to do it because they just have pens and it's hard to draw the barcode. <laughs> <laughs> All right, closing pop with accuracy. Again, huge issue. Um, if we close something and somebody put 21,000 pounds instead of 2,100 pounds, generally, Mr. Winthrop, and I'll later here, um, I would find out because he'd come running down to my office and say, we just spent a million dollars on accident. <laughs> yeah. Right? But no, I mean, the point is, is uh, we got a big mess to go back in and clean up, and we really didn't like that mess at all. That none of us did, because it's difficult to do. So proper ratios must be enforced to protect the GLs. In the past, using the back flush, we manually adjusted the ratio, meaning the person doing the back flushing just didn't make the 21,000 pound mistake, but somebody on the line might make that mistake a whole lot. Uh, WISIS um, enables our production managers to quickly find and remedy errors. Uh, we have a ratio screen that highlights out of bal balance issues. Items are often found in width. So this is another nice thing that came out of this. A lot of times you accidentally consume items because someone forgot to put it away. Okay. 
So here, we find items that are still in width, and we put it back in inventory, which also helps balance. Um, and then real issues can be noted and reported. So if someone really did hit a toe and knock it over and it's on the floor and it went into scrap, um, we can actually note that on the pop order. So then when Tracy <laughs> got a balance by 10%, he'll know that you know they lost the product. And then clean clothes equals a happy tray. <laughs> and so here's a ratio screen, and uh, I'm getting a little short on time, but if you saw the SQL that built this, it's literally three or four pages of SQL. It's, it's ridiculous. But what it's doing is it's taking our bond ratios, what it thinks that we should have used based on what was produced. So we have the same problem with buzzer and mill as we do in receiving. When we mix something or mill something, we may have an order for 80,000 pounds, but the bottom line is if we put 83,000 pounds in, we're not going to stop it and throw away 3,000 pounds. We're going to overproduce. Um, same thing holds true. If, if we put in 80,000 pounds and we have a bunch of, of loss through dusting and other you know, cracks, whatever, um, you're going to report 78,000 pounds, and we're not going to go in and adjust the initial plot for So we can't take the McCullough tool, which looks at what you order, you know, what your pop order was set for versus what you produced. It just doesn't work for us at, at all. What we want to do is look at what was produced versus the bomb ratio, and then do a bunch of uh, analysis against those numbers. So what this basically does is does all that math for them for every product that goes into the pop order on the bomb. And it comes out and says, well, this was off by 4.88%. Okay? And that's out of balance for, for where we want. And so someone needs to go in and look at why. And then this also shows us you know, all of our production. And they have some buttons for transaction pop in and out. But the bottom line is, if that's out of balance, they don't hit, and this one doesn't show up, but for the closer, there's a close button. And if it's in balance, they just hit the button and they close that pop order and they're done. We also have this view for the managers because it's important that the managers see if they forgot to issue enough of something and it's out of balance that they need to go down there and figure out why the issues aren't taking place in the world. So really, we, for those of you that haven't figured that out, what we did at Weiss is we took the shop floor material model and made it work in pop. Pop so, plus. And pop plus. So, so that's kind of what we call it. But, just like in shop floor, if you forgot to go into Macola and issue the material, you'd see that you had a hole in your data. You have to watch the same thing with Pop Plus. So now you have a more open material model, and you can really get down to those variables. We also have a post-closing screen for Trey that will look at um, the, the dollar amount mm -hmm. as well, and it will show something that stands out, because he wants to know if we're spilling a lot of material off. Right. Maybe the bill of materials was set up wrong. Bill of materials set up, I mean, yeah. there's a lot of reasons. And so he also has an ability screen that actually looks at the GLs rather than the pop orders and the issues that shows him the dollar and cent side of it after closing. Okay, so pick back four, moving into the warehouse. This is where our project stands today. Um, we had this built in pick back three. Pick pack four is much better. It was worth the effort to undo what we had started and, and go into pick pack four. So um, warehouse projects, hardware setup. So again, we're covering over 300,000 square feet of area. So there's a large hardware project here. It was fun to do, um, and it's over. But uh, that was part of the project. Uh, set it, rebuild all the products under pick pack four. Um, one thing that I want to do, I want my shipment number to equal the OE order number. They should be synonymous in our uh, environment because we don't really build shipments. We just pick orders and send them off by the truckload. So um, that's another thing that I'm doing. And then I'm going to use the same logic as that quick scan. So when they quick scan the OE order number, I'm going to do a, a shipment order lookup and pull the, the shipment. So, and it'll save time. And it'll also be used in agility for, for confirmed ship. The, the reason why I'm doing this is because for the people, they're used to working off that OE order number. And so their mentality never changes. They know right where to look on all our paperwork. And they're just going to use the same 
queues that they have to follow along. Oh, and we use a user-defined field for staging. Um, one thing in WISIS, you have a staging uh, bin for stage things. Well, our staging bin is like the whole backside of 79 bay doors. It's unbelievably large, and we just can't say it's over there. So we use a, a user-defined field to store this, the bin number for the staging location. So we can tell the truck to go to door 74. All right, so a little tip from the IT guy in me. Invest in good hardware. <coughs> I couldn't imagine this project using garbage hardware. Um, we bought Cisco, and we have not regretted it once yet. It's worth the investment. I have a centrally managed uh, wireless network. Um, it's got redundancy built in. We're a 24-hour facility. If this thing were having trouble all the time, people would hate wireless because of the hardware. And uh, you know, there's a lot of systems that are centrally managed out there, and, and I just I cannot say it enough. Make the investment because it's the foundation of this entire thing that you're going to spend a whole lot of time, money, and effort. It's it's critical. And then the MC 9090s, although today we've had a little bit, I feel a little standing up here saying yeah, they're great. We seldom ever have issues with this hardware. Uh, I've floored that it happens in the It's just one of those things. Anyhow, good hardware is key. Uh, okay, so that's it for me. Anybody have any questions? How do we get a copy of your presentation? I can email it to you. I love that. Because there's so much in there that in this short period of time of having to digest, you know. And your tables and stuff like that. <laughs> no, I mean, this no. is. That would be great. If you send it to me, I'll put it on the web. Okay. Yeah. yeah, we've spent. There's so much. I, I filtered this down from like 70 slides to 35. There is so much I can show you guys. It, in, it, AP, they wanted to, I mean, they used to alphabetically sort the list of people that we should call for, you know, sending their payments in. And I said, wouldn't it make a lot more sense to just take the guys who owe us the most money for the longest period of time, or just have a grid where you could flip it all upside down backwards, whichever way. So we built this whole collections management system in Agility with notes and tagging. And now the, the gals who do collections, they just tag up the system. And anyone in finance can go in there and see where are we at in accounts receivable in, in real time. You know, I mean, I could go in if I'm going to do something with a customer, and I could go say, well, that customer just got contacted, and they're still ninety days out. So, anyhow, it's it's great. Can you describe your training process, particularly for you? You put a lot of emphasis on production managers. And also the folks on the floor, the yep. line workers. And so I can't, I do 100% of the training. Um, and it's difficult because we have three shifts and you have to basically be there. Um, well, let me start with the training. We, we basically bring every, but everyone in the conference room and I will go ahead and I'll, I'll do the actual training. But the key to back up the training for me is always documentation. And I document everything uh, to a fault, but the, the employees have, actually their managers uh, in most cases, we just have so many employees that I want to make 200 copies of something. But the managers leave with documents step by step of how to issue, how to return, um, what everything means on the screen with little tips built in. Um, if I had my laptop, I unfortunately had to switch computers because I only have HDMI, but I'd, I'd love to show you the documentation. Um, so after we do the in-house training, uh, and another thing I'll mention is 100% of our development is done in the sandbox. So I have a whole other Wysis server with a whole other Mercola server, and 100% of it is detached from our live data. So, yep. And, and what happened when we went live with receiving, we received into the test company side by side with the real company, the paperway. 
for about a month before they really had it dialed in enough to where we trusted, okay, we're ready to go live. And then we flipped the switch. And then when we flipped the switch, I came in and I and, and my staff came in and we literally spent 24 hours a day for three days on site, standing in receiving, making sure that they if they had any questions at all that we were there to help. Um, and in receiving, um, they didn't have any questions. They had it down. They were just ready to go. In production, it was a, a it would have been a train wreck had we not been standing on the floor. And that was after months of training. But so we do the, the initial training, we do the reinforcement training. Um, in production, we, we actually had some changes, so we had to bring it in a third time. Um, we, we documented it, and then when we went live with our production uh, processes, my staff was there for, actually for 40 straight, 24, 24 hours. And we just literally tagged along with guys, and I just walk up, hey, have any trouble? Oh, well, I don't quite understand this. You know, you go through. And sometimes with one, I, I remember one guy, I basically did the entire training with him, again, on his gun, standing there in the warehouse. Some guys are going to get it, some guys take a while. Um, yes? What kind of turnover did you experience when you went through this implementation for WD? As far as employees? Yeah. Oh, we, no. people come to work for it. The, no, I mean, not only, but as a result of implementing this system. Not. Amazing. You know, if I tried to take away Wysis, um, I would probably get fired. I, I'd definitely get killed. <laughs> <laughs> then, I mean, you got to understand, it, our place is big. I mean, some places may be bigger, but if you're trying to find salt in 300,000 feet, you don't know where the hell it's at, and you're driving your port truck around while you've got all this other pressure of production, it causes a lot of stress. Now they just look it up and they go, well, we have salt in B0714, and we have salt in B160. Oh, no, there, somebody just issued it, so let's not drive over there. Um, and then in receiving, you know, I, the amount of time we saved, because they used to write it all down, they sent it up to the office, and then someone would walk down there, I can't read this. Just, those problems are gone. I mean, there is that initial, like, shock of a new system, but with this, it wears off very quickly, very quickly, and, and people are very happy. And I don't turn over for Boss Red Mill. Once, I mean, we're ESOP, the company's great, we have great products, people just stay. So I, I would say none, if you agree. Yeah, not by choice. <laughs>